From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's Just the Tip Stirs with Melissa Morgan. If you've got a tip on anything you find interesting, an unsolved murder, a freaky real-life mystery, the truth behind what really happened to the new Coca-Cola, anything, tell us about it by leaving a voicemail message on the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's area code 832-847-7837. Or send us an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. And now, here's your host, at her computer joyfully Googling terms guaranteed to attract the attention of law enforcement, Melissa Morgan. More cowbell? Look, officer, I was Googling skull rape because it's a site on how to perform oral sex better. It is not what you think. (laughs) It's not at all what you think, officer. Why? Thank you. (laughs) Please. Well, you would benefit more than anyone, I guess, Uh, producer Mark. Okay. Yeah. So please, um, can we make a pact that we delete each other's internet search cookies if (laughs) something bad happens? I I, I guess we should get the guarantee that you will. I don't know any of your passwords, but uh, you, you, God knows what you Google, I don't want to know. That's the beautiful part of our relationship. We... Just live in our separate bubbles. We have no idea. Lots what the of other. lots of stuff on dictionary.com. Liar. Up- oh my God, you lie. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So, yeah, I uh, my Google searches are um, somewhat different. So, yeah, I, I really have never uh, searched for skull rape, but I thought it was funny along with your intro. God bless you for your intro. So, this week's podcast is uh, fascinating to me on many levels. Mm-hmm the subject matter. I actually hate to talk about him. I prefer to talk about his victims. Unfortunately, we won't know a whole lot of them because he took his own life before he um, explained a lot. But the person that he got caught killing, Samantha Koenig, I'd rather it be about her than him, although he is one fascinating motherfucker. But before I get to Israel Keys, I have a few um, quotes, uh, impressions, <laughs> Not like, not like Groucho Marx impressions. But um, if I used to work in the entertainment industry, and I managed comedy clubs. I managed um, some comics. I uh, worked for agents and managers when I moved to California. And I have a pretty good memory for things that uh, affected me, made me laugh till I you know, inverted my nostrils, you know, whatever. So there are a few really funny bits from comics about serial killers. And one of my favorites uh, was from Roger Rittenhouse, who uh, lives in Los Angeles now, was a very funny comic from Denver. And he's the person who taught me, you can pretty much say any punchline ever. And a lot of his punchlines were dark, like midnight dark. Um, but you can say pretty much any punchline if you say it with a smile. And Roger was blessed to have these gorgeous teeth, like crazy, I'm going to say a reference that everyone's too young to know, but on the Carol Burnett show, Lyle Wagner teeth, where if the uh, camera hit it a certain way, they would like glisten with, you know, sequins. So Roger with these big, beautiful teeth would say, (laughs) I, and I actually contacted him uh, via the most uh, accurate way to get a hold of someone, which is Facebook Messenger. I contacted him. I was like, look, I remember this joke. Is this it? And he said, I think it went this way, but I like your way better. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it the way I remember hearing it, and I think Roger would be okay with this. So I remember him pacing up and down the stage with a, just this giant smile on his face saying, uh, you know, I used to be a serial killer. I hated the work, but I loved the travel. Gosh, it's great to be back in Kentucky. So that was what I remembered. And I remember another really funny joke about being able to hose um, your trunk out if you uh, potentially had a dead hooker in it. I don't remember the setup for that because I bet that would be hilarious. So the next thing is actually um, an audio tape uh, version of the punchline uh, sort of a long punchline. It's only about a minute long from Kyle Kinane, 
who is a Chicago comic who is the voice of Comedy Central. You hear him do all of their voiceovers for their commercials. Comedy Central um, on XM Radio, Comedy Central on television. He's kind of the whole voice of Comedy Central and a remarkable stellar comic. So in this bit, and it's awful and wonderful and unfortunately motherfucking true, he is discussing going on a walking tour in England of the sites that were supposedly the body dump areas for Jack the Ripper. So it's it's pretty stellar and pretty funny, and it will make you, I think, have some hometown pride and uh, nation pride. <laughs> so producer Mark, can you hit it? But then we get to the end of it. We get to the big finale, and he's got everybody gathered around, and this is this big climax moment of the tour, and he's got everybody there, and this is where he just sends it home. And he's got everybody goes, and it's believed that in total, Jack the Ripper may have killed up to five victims. <laughs> now, I know that this is a weird time to get welled up with national pride. But I had to turn to my friend. I was like, did he say five? We've been rolling our ankles on cobblestone for three hours? For five? We paid 60 pounds. I don't even know how much that is in real money. For fucking five? And I got real USA. I was like, I'm from America, baby. We got somebody killing five people right now. (laughs) And we don't give them walking tours, neither. You know, a walking tour, if everybody killed five people in this country, the whole 48 lower states would just look like half-price tickets at Disneyland. That's what it just looked like. (laughs) Wisconsin alone would have so many people and they'd be tipping off into the lake. So that is Kyle Kinane spelled with two K's. And I I understand it's not, you know, something you typically want to be proud of, but he's right. I mean, Wisconsin alone, pretty fascinating state with a lot of weird ass shit up there. I don't know if it's because it's cold. I don't know if it's too much cheese. Everyone's blocked up and nobody can shit. So you have to kill people and take their skin off and make lampshades. I don't know, but it's, it's a really funny on the nose bit that's true. You know, they say it's funny because it's true. But so if there was a walking tour for Israel Keys, we would have to do a um, a Forrest Gump walk across the country because this guy was different than most others. He wasn't just a serial killer. He was a serial killer, rapist, arsonist, burglar, and bank robber. I think most serial killers like to specialize in their chosen field of serial killing. Um, he liked to branch out. I think he thought of himself as a Renaissance man. And and later on, I'll read his um, poetic suicide note. And he is kind of a Renaissance man, an artist of uh, of horrible proportions. Let's just say that. So he was pretty young when he uh, ended his life and had a pretty full life doing a lot of really bad shit. So he was uh, born in, in uh, January of 1978 in Richmond, Utah. And he was raised in a Mormon family that sort of went askew. And he was homeschooled. I'm not saying anything else. I'm just going to leave that. I'm just going to lay that right there. He was homeschooled. So uh, he lived in Utah. Uh, his parents were devout, but... I don't exactly know to what, because they behaved unlike any Mormons I've ever heard of in my life. They they moved and joined uh, a different church that was uh, extremely anti-Semitic and racist, um, which every Mormon I know couldn't be further from that. So I don't know what uh, sect of Mormonism they, um, they, I think they left the Mormon church is my guess. But they were still very devout. And when Israel um, came out, 
so to speak, as an atheist in his teens, um, they sort of kicked him out of the family. They would still speak to him, but he wasn't allowed to attend certain family functions, etc. So he had some issues in his teen years that nobody paid attention to. I'll address that later. Uh, torturing small animals, um, bullying neighbors, etc. So he joined the army, which I a lot of people do with this sort of proclivity, not just the army, but armed forces. And I feel like they they need the structure. And maybe the structure helps them figure out what they want to do in their life, or maybe they just become better at what they are, which is a monster. And it seems like his three years, four years in the army made him a better monster. He did a small uh, stint in Egypt. He got uh, several decorations and awards, Army Achievement Medal, Army Service Ribbon, Marksman Badge, Expert Infantry Badge, Air Assault Badge, all these wonderful, you know, awards, prizes, decorations handed to him. And he was really excited that his tour was coming to an end because he couldn't wait to get out there and start killing people. Now that's interesting. He he let that piece of information go in over 40 hours of taped interview with uh, local police and the FBI after he was finally caught. So he said, he said, I couldn't wait to get out of the army so I could go start killing people? Yes, sir. Oh my, okay. Yeah, there, there are other people who have posited the theory, what if we took all the serial killers and put them in uniforms and sent them wherever we wanted them to go and, you know, start killing Osama bin Laden's? It's an interesting theory, but I'm not sure that they would... Most serial killers have a, a real control freak tendency. Yeah, I don't think they follow orders. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not sure they would. It's like, kill that guy. No, I don't like him. I want this one. Yeah, so, I think Sarge might end up <laughs> sliced and diced. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was like, I couldn't wait for my tour to end. Couldn't wait to get out. I just wanted to get out there and start killing people. Uh-huh. So he is interesting in the fact that he assimilated pretty easily there. Everyone always says, you know, I had no idea. He was a sweet neighbor, quiet, kept to himself. There's always signs. There's definitely signs, which we will talk about later, but he moved to Alaska. He started a business. I mean, I know, uh, you know, Phi Beta Kappas who can't fucking tie their shoes. And here's a guy who his main goal in life is how many people can I kill and how can I do this? And, and so much thought and planning. He really could have been a captain of industry. I'm not saying anything else. Um, but he, you know, started this, this construction company. He did handyman stuff. He was a contractor. And by every client's account, he was, get this, meticulous, patient, uh, amenable. I mean, there was not, I mean, I guess if you did Yelp reviews for, you know, uh, Anchorage, Alaska contractors, Israel Keys number one in the Yelp reviews. Now, if you did Yelp reviews for horrible, shitty monster serial killers, well, he might also be number one. I hadn't really thought of it that way. I think I'm just going to try and keep Yelp out of this. So his time in the army, a couple of people noticed strange things. Uh, one of his, um, bunk mates, I don't know what you call them, Rumi, said that he, you know, stayed to himself. Shocker. But on the weekends, he would drink heavily. He would consume entire bottles of his favorite drink, which was wild turkey bourbon. And that, he, it, I don't know if you know that, <laughs> that, that's, that was Hunter Thompson's uh, poison. That stuff ain't uh, lightweight. It's r rubbing alcohol, I'm guessing. Close. Close to rubbing alcohol or Tastes sterno. Tastes a little better, apparently. I've a little never bit, tried it myself, but... A little better than sterno. And I, I don't think Hunter Thompson killed a lot of people that I know of. But yeah, I don't know that, you know, saying someone who consumes wild turkey is going to turn you into a serial killer. But, you know, it, it makes sense. Here's the thing that I think might uh, be a clue that he could have eventually become a serial killer. He was heavily into the musical group, and I, I don't even want to use the word music, uh, Insane Clown Posse. And he had a bunch of uh, his their posters hanging in his barracks. So, yeah, the Insane Clown Posse, worst man on earth, and basically the favorite of a lot of serial killers and 
um, maybe just people who've only killed one person. What was that, Daniel Sarazon? Did I hear, what? Insane Clown Posse? Why, yes. So anyway, Mr. Deep, Keith. Deep breath. Sorry, huh? I know. Yeah. I, just, I, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll never get over it. So um, lived in Anchorage, a successful businessman, frighteningly so. Had a girlfriend. And this is the really sad part. And I hope she is being protected. It sounds like she is because I see nothing about her in any sort of uh, journalism at all. Um, he has a daughter. I think that plays into decisions he made later um, because he would not, when I say meticulous, this is a scary meticulous. I'm OCD to a certain extent and a control freak, admittedly. Producer Mark, uh, probably a little OCD. I think I'm probably more than him, but control freak, a uh, fuck yes. Uh, yeah, we're two control freaks. It's a lot of fun sometimes here at the house as we try and psychically battle one another as to who's going to get what and um, do what. Right, Mark? <clears throat> <laughs> so he would spend an inordinately long amount of time planning these things. I mean, really a long amount of time. He's, I think, the only person, at least who's been caught and, and fessed up, who has admitted to b burying kill kits across the country. Kill kits. Now that's, that's incredible. It, it's really incredible. He would bury kits that contained money, Drano, weapons, plastic bags, rope. I mean, if you found it, you'd be like, what's it? Oh, it's a kill kit. I mean, you would know immediately when you found it. It's like, this ain't, this guy ain't a plumber. He's up to no good. Shovels, ammunition. I mean, it was, it was spectacular. His, I don't know if he used like Tupperware, rubber made plastic bins. I don't really know his uh, chosen uh, objects to bury things in, but uh, so far, two of his kill kits have been found uh, posthumously by the FBI. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? You're walking around a state park and you're like, what is this? A handle sticking out of the ground? Oh my God, it's one of Israel Keys kill kits. I'm not sure you would know that because I'm telling you his name is not well known. And he's one of the more fascinating people I've ever met and frightening for many, many reasons because he could assimilate, because he was apparently an easy guy to talk to. Well, um, how did he get around the country to, to do that? Well, he wasn't a truck driver, right? No. <laughs> This is another one of his brilliant plans. Again, um, I, I don't know anyone like this. Now, perhaps some serial killers uh, steal um, probably close to home, like from family or something, to, to um, afford their hobby, so to speak. Uh, a lot of them have full-time jobs and maybe save up money like other people would save up to buy a pair of Uggs. They save up to fashion their next project, their artistic work of, you know, going about slaughtering people. He robbed banks. He is um, undetected, by the way. Uh, the FBI now estimates he robbed between 20 and 30 homes. Uh, there, There's two videotapes of him robbing a bank. One is with a, a goatee and mustache and sunglasses. And one is with a hard hat, sunglasses, and a uh, a mask you put over your face if you're doing construction. You don't want to get dust in your face. I think if you walk into a bank like that, somebody ought to just fucking kneecap you because you're not there because you're, you know, expanding the the safe room. You're there because you're a motherfucking bank robber who's, yeah. So he would um, rob homes, <laughs> rob banks <laughs> to fund his hobby, but... It wasn't just like, I'm going to fly to Miami and kill a bitch. No. He actually made between 25 and 30 trips between like 2001 and 2012. Back and forth across the country. I think, plan, you know, planning, um, burying kill kits, seeing areas he liked. But he was so detail-oriented and meticulous he would fly to one city, 
drive up to a thousand miles in a rental car to another city, pay for everything in cash, uh, turn his cell phone off, and just scope out where he wanted to go. He made sure there were no victims that were in his hometown, no victims he could be tied to. And the way he got caught was he broke his own rule, which was never take them to your home or your car. If they don't have a car, I'm not going to kill them. But wait, house. I have a question. How? What was Please. his excuse for all this travel? I, if he's based in Alaska, was that a business? Was he doing bus- on business trips or what? Why does it matter? I'm just curious. No, I mean, I'm just, well, I'm, no, that's a great question, but. How did he, he was married, right? Did, how no, did he, well, not oh, married, his girlfriend. Oh, okay, well. Girlfriend. No, they broke up, like, after so many years. She I took see. the daughter and moved. I don't know how long they were together. They were together for a period of time because they lived together in a house. Um, They questioned her, and of course, she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. He acted weird, so I took our daughter and left. But one of his rules, and I believe, it, no matter what has happened and he's gone and left a very um, uninformational suicide letter, he wouldn't, he had rules. He wouldn't go to a house with um, a dog or a bikes or toys in the yard. And an FBI profiler feels that he wouldn't, go to a house with a kid because he had his own daughter. He never expressed remorse for what he did, but did express offhandedly to FBI, you know, uh, I, there's certain things I don't want you to release because I don't want my mother to have a heart attack. So I, I think he had some sort of something in him, um, like most control freaks do a fear of being embarrassed It's come out now that he not only would rape um, women, he probably raped men. They think that his early religious upbringing, he was also a necrophiliac, which he admitted freely. He did not admit to raping men, but, but did admit to being a necrophiliac because they feel his religious upbringing, once again, the religion... (laughs) has helped fashion uh, just a fascinating piece of shit. Um, He thought people would be uh, horrified. Not that he killed people, but that he, you know, stuck his dick in some guy's ass. That's just great. So you can fuck a dead person. You can kill and fuck a dead person, but you, you know, the fact that you might be gay, that, you know, gee, even though he professed to being an atheist. So he admitted to a murder of two people after he was caught for the one murder that they could actually pin on him. One. He violated his own rules. He was just going to rob this coffee kiosk. I guess there are a, a whole shitload of coffee kiosks in uh, in Anchorage, Alaska, because it's cold and people want warm coffee. So this beautiful 18-year-old girl, Samantha Koenig, is working in March of 2012. And um, she, no, sorry, February of 2012. February of 2012. She is working at her coffee kiosk job early in the morning. He walked, and this is what he told, you know, in the interviews, he walked purposefully toward the kiosk with the intention of robbing her if uh, she didn't have a car. And if she did have a car, he would kidnap her and rape her and kill her. So what he did to her, I think you can see his spiraling downward. And perhaps the fact that his girlfriend left with their daughter, maybe that was the stressor. I don't know. But he he kind of admits that he um, his ego got in the way and he violated his own rules. So he goes up to the coffee kiosk. It's actually on video. He was ignorant. It was one of his rental cars. He was ignorant and that he is basically shown on a lot of closed caption television in this instance. Went up in his hometown uh, in Anchorage, went up to her coffee kiosk. Um, You can see her handing him a cup of coffee and then you see her put her hands up and back away from the drive-thru window. 
So you know, oh, oh, he's probably got a gun and she thinks she's being robbed. And he crawls through the drive through window and takes the money and takes her. Now he took her, raped her and strangled her. She woke back up and he strangled her again. Left her in a shed on his property in Anchorage. Quickly drove to Texas the same day. Sorry, I apologize. Flew to Texas the same day and got on a two-week cruise. Now, Samantha Koenig is dead in a shed in his on his property. He comes back from his cruise, uh, flies back to Anchorage, finds a four-day-old... Um, a local Anchorage uh, newspaper and props her body up and takes a picture so that it looks like she's still alive, like um, proof of uh, the Anchorage Daily News. So it's like proof of life. So, and then sent it, uh, because he had her phone, texted it to her family, found her brother, texted it to her brother and demanded $30,000 in ransom which, by the way, he got and started, I guess they, uh, because he had her ATM card, I guess they put the money in. It was, it was actually from a, a victim's fund. Her family put the money into her account. And here's where he got caught. He started using her ATM card. And he knew he, knew was, he was going to get caught. He knew it was going to happen. I think he wanted to get caught. I think he wanted, I, I just think he wanted it to be over. He had to. That's so blatant. Everything you everything you just described is so blatant and against everything else he was doing before. Yeah. Yeah, because he was so careful and so planned. So he ended up, he was arrested um, in Texas, uh, March 16th. So about six weeks after, after he kidnapped her. And th- they spent, a, like I said, 40 hours interviewing him uh, on videotape. I'm sure they won't release some of it, but I'm applauding law enforcement and the FBI for releasing what they have because a lot of it's on YouTube. And more importantly, the FBI has released a list of cities that between like 2001 and 2011 that he, 25 to 30 cities, they found, you know, travel records. And they think he was either there killing people or planning on killing people. The thing that's horrifying is that when he was uh, arrested um, using her ATM card in in Texas, he had a list of places to go, and one of them was California. And this is, you know, they they a lot of stories compare him to Ted Bundy, and everyone was always like, "Oh, Ted Bundy was handsome and charming," and I'm like, "Yeah, no, I mean, he obviously extremely intelligent." And I think he was studying to be a lawyer. I mean, he was, you know, Ted Bundy, really smart. A lot of serial killers really smart. Doesn't really, yeah, that's fine. Ted Bundy looked like someone had set face his face on fire and put it out with a rake. He had the worst skin I've ever seen in my life. He had piercing eyes. I, I don't, I never thought Ted Bundy was attractive. I don't get it at all. I will be honest with you, Israel Keys, kind of attractive. Disturbing horrifying to say it and you can see almost a de-evolution when he has somewhat longer hair he has a more open face and he has almost a slight smirk and it's um it's a booking photo and i don't know for what but probably something very small since he didn't really you know get caught doing the big shit till later but his actual mugshot from being arrested for killing samantha koenig his eyes are dark in a way that you just have to see the picture. His hair is short, his lips are pursed, his eyes are dark. There's a definite difference. And the thing that makes him more fascinating to me, besides all of this interesting shit that he did to prepare for his art, is his suicide note, because he mentions a soul. And I don't know if that's just remnants of his religious upbringing, or if he believes we have a soul, if he believes he has a soul or had a soul, I don't know. But he 
did mention in his interviews that he was very fascinated by Ted Bundy, but really adamant that his ideas were his own, his own, and he never copied off of anyone. His and I do have to say it's pretty original and unique. I don't. There may be other serial killers we don't know about who, who have shit stashed places, but his so methodical, bizarrely funded with robberies so well done and wanting to have no ties to his victims. He said, you know, you don't, you don't have your pick sometimes, but when you do get, you know, your, you do get to do your job, your work as a serial killer, it's exhilarating. So a lot of serial killers have a type and you can see it with the victims lined up. He didn't have a type because he didn't want to get caught, but He said that he really fucked up with Samantha Koenig because it was just going to rob her, but the compulsion to kill her overtook him. And that's where he fucked up. And he fucked up bad, but still not enough to not be caught for quite a while, (laughs) keeping her in a frozen shed so she didn't look like she was decomposing. So the other two people that he's actually linked to Uh, never going to find their bodies. Stroke of luck. And this is the thing that horrifies me and makes me worry so much about missing people like Will Sayers on. We don't know where Will is. Is he missing? Is he deceased? Most probably. And ways to get rid of people more difficult and yet maybe more easy than we can imagine. So, Two years before he kills this wonderful couple in Vermont, um, he the couriers, he flies to Chicago. He rents a car and drives a thousand miles to Vermont. And he had buried a kill kit there two years earlier. He scopes out the place for three days. He does what he calls a blitz attack and he looks for houses with attached garages i don't get i i don't understand really the dog thing unless he just doesn't want to um mess with a dog maybe he thinks a dog would hurt him or maybe i I think it's that he didn't want to kill a dog but i don't know he killed you know small animals but he wouldn't enter a home with a kid because his daughter so bill and lorraine courier Wonderful, simple couple at home asleep. He has never met them. He doesn't know them. Um, He was staying a half a mile from their house. And their house looks pretty desolate, but he was staying at a like Homewood Suites or something like a half a mile from their house. He uh, took a fan out of a window in the garage, came in through the garage, wore a headlamp to light the way in the dark and blitzed attacked them. He really fucked up here because both of them uh, managed to get away, but they were both caught by him. It was really heartbreaking. And these are two big, pretty, pretty big people. He doesn't look like a big man, but I think that's another thing that serial killers enjoy is the control, having control over someone. So Bill and Lorraine Courier are asleep at night. He attacks them, takes them to an abandoned farmhouse that he had scoped out the day before. He rapes and strangles, well, sorry, he rapes Lorraine, ties her up with restraints. He goes over maybe to rape Bill, who is a a big man, by the way. And Lorraine gets out of her restraints and runs toward the road. He recaptures her, brings her back, ties her up, rapes her and strangles her. In the meantime, Bill gets out of his restraints. And is screaming, where's my wife? Where's my wife? And he shoots Bill because I guess he has to take him down faster because Bill is a pretty tall, big man and he may not be able to control the situation. He puts them in plastic bags and leaves them in the abandoned barn, abandoned barn and leaves town. And the abandoned barn two years later is demolished demolished. No one knows. Everything's taken to a landfill. No one knows. They're just missing. 
Bill like and the their rain. bodies remained in the in the barn, mm-hmm. and nobody looked. Yep. Oh my God. And everything is taken to the dumpster, to the landfill. So, as he's telling his story, a local Vermont cop says, "I know every inch of that area. I have looked for Bill and Lorraine, and I know what motherfucking barn he's talking about." He shows up, finds out that the barn's been demolished. He has um, cadaver dogs who find the scent of decomposition. That is the only way that they have connected Bill and Lorraine to him. Wow. It would have gone unsolved, unnoticed, and he would have gotten away with it had he not fucked up with Samantha Koenig. And then he's tied to to these two people just because he admitted it. He, again, didn't want certain pieces of information out. He didn't want his name linked to this couple, again, probably because of a fear of being called gay. And when his name was leaked out, even though the FBI promised to not connect him to this, he didn't speak to the FBI for two months. He wouldn't talk for two months because he didn't want pieces of information out. And he is a control freak. He was a control freak. So he admitted to killing under 12. (laughs) They think he killed between 8 and 11 people. He admitted to killing a woman in New Jersey and burying her in upstate New York. So he was experimenting not only with leaving his area and going to other places, but with taking people from one state and then killing them in another. He really capitalized on the fact that law enforcement doesn't communicate. Uh, It's a big deal if you are sometimes in the same state, a different city, a different county. It's, I don't understand with all of the advancements in technology, things like CODIS, where you can enter someone's fingerprint or DNA and say, hey, they were connected to this in Arkansas and this in Alabama, why law enforcement isn't a little more uh, willing to communicate. It's it's a, an ego-driven thing. I, I don't understand. It's Maybe it's so people can justify their own job. Like, I have this job here and I am the uh, gatekeeper of this file that no one else can see. It's it's horrifying. So he capitalized on that fact that law enforcement doesn't communicate well. And he made that his bitch. And he took people from one state and killed them in another or buried in a, them in another. And we may never know. That's why the FBI has actually put out a list of cities asking if, you know, um, do you know Israel Keys? Have you met Israel Keys? Did you have a weird encounter? Is uh, someone missing from your family? I mean, it's it's hor- between these years and these states and these cities. It's it's horrifying and fascinating and awful and bizarre. And he really just spiraled down until he, if he had kept to his own rules, I don't know that we would ever know. He he may have gone to his grave with all of his gross, nasty secrets, but he didn't. And he, well, he did sort of. (laughs) Yeah, there's still a lot of kill kits buried. uh, Well, uh, the the FBI has found two of, I think he said between five and eight that he had buried across the country. So the FBI has found two of his kill kits. Um, The head of the uh, lieutenant for the Anchorage Police Department said everything that he has told them has borne, borne out. Everything he said that he did, not naming names, wouldn't name names of victims. He may know them. He may not. He probably knew them because he was he would fly back home immediately, leave town immediately after killing someone. So he wasn't even in town and look up, you know, the case on the Internet. So he was fascinated to to watch the cases. So he said that, you know, he didn't know the names of, you know, like, let's say the couple in Vermont that the couriers that he killed. Um, so he said he didn't know the names of these people, but you know, he, he may have, but he wouldn't tell them, he wouldn't tell them anything. So this, um, wonderful profiler, uh, 
Monique Dahl interviewed him and said that his motivation was really the enjoyment of doing his work. He was unapologetic. He had no remorse. And Monique Dahl said, Israel Keys didn't kidnap and kill people because he was crazy. He didn't kidnap and kill people because his deity told him to or because he had a bad childhood. Israel Keys did this because he got an immense amount of enjoyment out of it, much like an addict gets an immense amount of enjoyment out of drugs. So I guess you could say that an addict was born and his compulsion was not alcohol or drugs, but seeing the light go out in someone's eyes and being in control of that. As uh, another amazing comic says, Norm MacDonald, that thing that makes me feel like God, you go and do the thing that makes you feel like God. And his really, really funny bit about um, seeing someone named Janice who's missing and an you know, imaginary person named Janice. But it's pretty funny and pretty stellar. And I think he's got his finger on the pulse as far as what control freaky serial killers must think. So on December 1st of 2012, he was going to um, be indicted for basically just the murder of Samantha Koenig, but they were going to add the couriers in. That's the only ones they could really tie to him. He was moved from the suicide watch, which he had, he had attempted to escape several times. He wanted to be a uh, suicide by cop. He wanted to be taken out. He even said, I'll tell you this information. I'll tell you where everything is if you will let me pretend to escape and then kill me. And uh, the police were like, yeah, no, that, that doesn't work that way. We don't, we don't just do the what you want sanctioned suicide. I don't know that that would be a bad policy, but I, there's probably a lot of logistics and legal stuff involved. You'd have to have him sign a waiver. I don't know. Anyway, but he had tried to escape during a court appearance and was tased. Don't tase me, bro. And he was tased and brought back to a cell. So he was in a suicide watch cell. He said he would give them more information if they moved him back to a like double secret probation uh, ward where they were watched pretty heavily. They had a LED light that was in their cells and he killed himself. There were several missteps. Uh, The guard on duty took a, you know, sanctioned dinner break. And before he left, it's all on, you know, video. Israel Keys is seen sort of moving around his cell, straightening stuff. He was given a razor uh, by another guard, completely erroneously, should never have been given a razor. So he had a razor, and I guess he probably tore some clothing. He got into his bed at 10, 12, 12 minutes after 10 p.m., put his cover over his head, as he did apparently every night, and there was a little bit of movement, and then at 12, 24, there was a sudden jerk, and then it was stillness. So he sliced his own wrists and hung himself, sliced his wrist with uh, the razor and hung himself on the uh, post of the bed. So he wasn't found till the next morning. Um, The room is dark, like I said. His cell is dark. So the dripping and the pooling of his blood under his bunk wasn't noticed because it is very dark and because the video, according to the guards, are black and white. You really can't see what's happening. So that guard was fired. He actually fought for his job back, had an attorney. Um, it, It wasn't strictly his fault. I mean, it really wasn't his fault, but that's neither here nor there. So I have a, an edited version of his suicide letter, which I want to read. The FBI went to great lengths to preserve it because it was under his body and covered in blood. So they had to wash it, rinse it out. And it looks like your schoolwork, you dropped into a puddle. It's, um, part pen, part pencil on a legal pad. And 
I've heard several people say they think he's a shitty poet. I don't agree. <laughs> I guess, you know, poetry is in the eye of the beholder. I don't want to give him any credit, but I I find his um I find his wording interesting at best. I think a lot of serial killers probably think of themselves as poetic in their, you know, ridiculous form of uh, killing people. But his I I find his words pretty interesting. So he starts with, where will you go, you clever little worm, if you bleed your host dry? Again, sounds a little biblical to me. You may have been free. You loved living your lie. Fate had its own scheme, crushed like a bug, and you still die. Soon now you'll join those ranks of dead or your ashes. The wind will soon blow. Family and friends will shed a few tears and pretend it's off to heaven you go. But the reality is you were just bones and meat with your brain died also went your soul, which is the part that gets me because he thinks someone has a soul. I don't know if he thinks of himself as having a soul or his victims, but he thinks there's a soul. Send the dying to wait for their death in the comfort of retirement homes. Quickly, quietly, they say it's for the best. It's best for you so their fate you'll not know. Get in your big car so you can get to work fast on roads made of dinosaur bones. Punch in on the clock and sit on your ass playing stupid ass games on your phone. Paper on your wall says you've got the smarts. The test that you took told you so. But you would still crawl like the vermin you are once your precious power grids are blown. Now that I have held you tight, I will tell you a story. Speak soft in your ear, and you'll know that it's true. You're my love at first sight, and though you're scared to be near me, my words penetrate your thoughts now, an intimate prelude. I looked in your eyes, they were so dark, warm, and trusting, as though you had not a worry or a care. The more guileless the game, the better the potential to fill up those pools with your fear. Your face framed in dark curls like a portrait. The sun shone through highlights of red. What color, I wonder, and how straight will it turn plastered back with the sweat of your blood? Your wet lips were a promise of a secret unspoken, nervous laugh as it burst like a pulse of blood from your throat. There will be no laughter here anymore. I feel your body tense up, my hand now on your shoulder. Your eyes, forget the lady called Luck. She does not abide near me, for her powers don't extend to those who are dead. My pretty captive, butterfly colorful wings, my hand smears, punishment and tears. Violent metamorphosis, emerge my dark moth princess. Come often and worship on the altar of your flesh. You shudder and try to shrink from me. I'll have you tied down and begging to become my sweetie. Okay, talk is over. Words are placid and weak. Back it with action or it all comes off cheap. Watch close while I work now. Feel the electric shock of my touch. Open your trembling flower or your petals I will crush. So I want to say there are always signs. There were signs. The people in his life knew he was weird, everyone from his family to his army buddies to his girlfriend, baby mama. It's the things that alert you, that you sweep in the back of the closet of your head and the things that make your skin crawl, the things you know aren't right and you don't know what to do about them, they might mean something really big later on. If you know of a young person who tortures animals, if you know of a young person that starts fires, that's another clue. And it sounds trite, but I'm going to say it. If you see something, say something. If you know something, say something. If you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, you might save 
a whole lot of lives later on. And more cowbell. And remember, if you've got a tip, maybe you'll find a kill kit in your backyard. Call us at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837. Or send us an email to jttipsters at gmail.com.